Hello and welcome to a very special show here on CNBC TV 18. I'm joined by somebody who wears many hats. He's not only the CEO of one of the world's most innovative companies, but he's also on the board of UN Foundation. Last year he became one of the few CEOs in the world to take the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. I'm joined now by the CEO of Ericsson, Mr. Hans Vesberg. Mr. Vesberg, thank you so very much. Thank you. Your ice bucket challenge went viral. A lot of people in India watched it. Yeah, yeah it was very cold, but I think it was a good course, so it was okay. <laughs> Many would say that the technology industry has undergone this tremendous transformation over the years. And Ericsson, you've been in the middle of it. So let's just take like 10 years ago. 10 years ago, overwhelming majority of your revenues were coming from hardware. Now overwhelming, almost two thirds are coming from software. So just talk to us about this transformation and do we see the software continuing to play and driving the majority of Ericsson's revenues going forward? No, it has been a dramatic transformation of the company. Of course, it's very much driven on, on what's happening in the market because the, the whole digitalization of the world also made us to start selecting what we should do. And, and over a 10 year period, of course, we have changed dramatically. We have gone from, as I said, the basic 75% of our revenues being hardware, now 66% is software and services, which is a tremendous change. And then you need to understand that that's different type of skill set, different type of people. And of course, that also means that we have recruited a lot of people around the world. And India has been a very important part for that transformation because we have our largest global service center here in India. That sort of, uh, we have grown up to 21,000 people in India right now from 5,000. Mm -hmm. But in general, the transformation has been dri uh, driven in order for us to be relevant in sort of the second phase of the technology revolution that we're into right now. And we really wanted to be the winner in the second phase. In the first phase, we feel we were the winner when the voice paradigm was there. Now the data paradigm, we're going to be the winner there as well. Right. Talking about India, uh, Mr. Vesberg, India is clearly, India's importance has increased for Ericsson over the years. It's already the third largest market for you in terms of revenues. Uh, tell us, Already we've seen you shifting a large part of your HR, that's global HR now is sort of, is done from India. Uh, also R&D, you've ramped up R&D operations. So talking now about, are there plans of making India some sort of an export hub as well? Is that the next step? Throw us some light on, the, on these plans. Yeah, no, when we did SAP there 2010, we decided that we're going to be the be best and, uh, and number one in the world on services. We, of course, looked into how can we have global centers delivering services worldwide. So we decided to ramp up in India from basically 5,000 to 21,000. The majority of them working 15, with 15,000 increase in yeah, your employment. In five years. In five years. And of course, and the majority of them working for the global Ericsson. There are some working, of course, for local market, but they are delivering services any place in the world. They basically are an export as well. That was sort of one of the decisions. At the same time, when we saw the capabilities that were created here in India, we started to put the R&D here, other global group functions uh, that we're doing here as well. Uh, and then already in 94, we started production for the Indian market. The next step right now that we have announced is that we now are opening a new factory in Pune in beginning of next year, which also is going to do transmission equipment, but not only for the Indian market. Now we're going to export from India as well. So for us, India has been very important for the transformation, and, and we are, have been investing a lot in India. So tell us a little bit about this plant. How much are you investing? And when do we see this plant becoming operational? We believe that somewhere in the second quarter next year it's going to be operational. If you only take the plant as such, it's probably 15 or 20 million US dollars, but it's everything else that is included. And of course, if we're going to have export to 180 countries, we are in 180 countries in the world, it's going to be far more investments over time. So that plant is going to export to 180 countries? And that's the plan. We're going to have our transmission equipment coming from one factory, and that's the Pune factory. So. I think that's part of how we're transforming the company as well. I mean, we have less hardware. We can have one factory basically in the whole world. Now we're selected to do that uh, for transmission here in India. I, uh, I started this by asking that India is one of your top markets, the third largest, but its contribution is still about 5% of your overall revenues. Going forward, the kind of investments that you're making, the, the way in which you're sort of hiking your overall employee strength, will India's share in your overall revenues go up? I think that... Uh, the digital transformation of the country of India is going to help us with that because I think that right now it's 900 million plus uh, mobile subscriptions in India, it will go to 1.4. The majority of the Indian population has still a 2G phone. But with the deployment right now of 3G and 4G, we're going to look here in, in a couple of years 
of a vast majority of the Indians actually having 3G and 4G. That is going to transform India in many cases. And of course, that's a great opportunity for Ericsson as well, both on infrastructure, services, and we're into building system and IT system as well. So I think that given that it's the second largest country when it comes to population in the world, and the 21st one century infrastructure, mm -hmm. which we're now coming in with, with, with a sort of the mobility, the broadband and cloud, will be so transformative. So of course, I have very high hopes for India that uh, we're going to continue to invest and grow here. And, uh, and the share may also go up. We hope so. I mean, every country is fighting for it. So we usually, as if you're in 180 countries, there, there are very few countries that really sticks out. I mean, but India sticks out. I think U.S. has been very strong for us uh, the last couple of years and almost stands for a fifth of our revenue. But uh, other than that, there are many small, many countries all around the world that stands up for our total. Mr. Vesberg, over the last seven to ten years, the nature of competition has also changed. The competition landscape has entirely changed. And, and European companies like yourself, Nokia, Alcatel, Lucille is facing a lot of competition from the Chinese uh, firms like Huawei. Um, what is your strategy? How are you looking to fight competition? Because many would say companies like you have been forced to change your business model because of competition from the East. Just tell us a little bit about the changing dynamics of this. Now, the change in dynamic is that I mean, if you look at the traditional area that we're into, mobile infrastructure, I mean, uh, I usually say that 10 years ago, 15 companies in the world could supply a 2G network. I would say it's probably three left. And uh, one has the same brand name and the same company. Massive that's a, consolidation. A massive consolidation. And that's a typical of a technology revolution because you need to change in order to be relevant. Ericsson is the only company that has been on both sides. One Chinese vendor came in the middle, done a great job, of course. And then, of course, it's a combination of six companies coming together in one. So, of course, it happened a lot. But at the same time, 45% uh, of my revenues in services, I meet totally different competition there. Uh, that would be large, uh, big IT companies from India or from US in billing systems. I would meet American companies. Uh, I would meet in uh, the TV me and media where I'm number one in the world as well. I would meet companies that we usually don't talk about. So when I talk to my 115,000 employees, they would say that, yes, in that area we are comp competing with them. But I think it's a very reflecting that when you are in this sort of the inflection point of this technology revolution, everybody needs to select what they're into. We dropped handsets, we right. sold off Sony Ericsson, yes. we dropped chipset, we left fixed assets, we left cables. So we have left a lot of things that we felt that we're not going to be the best in the world. We basically are acting in five areas and we're number, we're number one in four. So you, so you want to be leaner in your operations, yeah. more focused? Yeah, we want to be focused and we are driving for a company to be uh, very heavy on software and services. Uh, that was a decision and the combination of IT and telecoms. That was our genes and how we can be strong and how we want to transform and that's why we have this fairly big transformation on the company. There's also a lot of price competition now, especially in the emerging markets. Uh, you've had a long association with many of the telcos. Bharti Airtel is clearly one of them. But many would say that many of the newer contracts are now going more so to companies like Huawei and all. So what is, has Chinese competition forced you to price down in markets like India? I think that in general, I mean, uh, if you think about 15 companies down to three, of course there's been competition. If not, I mean, it's been 12 that has left the industry here. Yeah. So, of course, there's been competition. But I think that the, that has been pretty the same the last five years. No major, I mean, of course, people compete for a new, new contract. That, that's not, no news to that. So I think it's pretty similar as the last couple of years. And I think we also have been keeping our market share very well the last five years. It's a little bit now unbalanced as there's so much volumes going in China and we have a sort of lower uh, market share, average market share in China than in other markets. Other than that, I think we have kept up very well and we, we keep our number one position sort of installed base. Tell us a little bit about your, uh, about your long association with Bharti Airtel especially because they are now looking big at, uh, on uh, uh, LTE uh, and they're also expanding their 3G uh, circles in India. So what sort of a role do we see Ericsson playing in that? I think, we, first of all, we have a relationship with many carriers all around the world, but uh, uh, you, you're right for to say it. Of course, we have a long relationship with the Bharti Airtel, and, and of course, we, we have been working both on infrastructure, but we've also been uh, running the networks basically since the inception, where they outsourced a large part to us. So, of course, it's a, a special relationship, but we have many special relationships. I mean, Ericsson has been around uh, in many countries more than 100 years. We came to India in 1903. Right. So, of course, we have a relationship that goes beyond that. And 
uh, time, you know, and, and uh, one of our core values is perseverance. I mean, we stay with our customer in good days, in bad days, and that's sort of what has created this company. One issue that Indian customers have been facing has been the issue of call drops. There have been a, a growing incidence of that. Beyond Spectrum, what technology can Ericsson, how can Ericsson help to fight this issue? I think in, in general terms, I can talk about the drop calls, etc. Uh, we do a lot of innovation on this. I mean, we work daily, and I meet all my customers all around the world all the time talking about how can they improve the quality of the network. There are two things happening. First of all, it's a lot of new devices coming in the network, and if you had the feature phones, you didn't even use the network almost. You get the smartphone, you use it tremendously. So of course, it's a constant growth of the data in the network. We, we believe it's going to be 12 times more data in the networks than the next five years. It's just going to boom. Uh, so that's important. So what you can do is, of course, the indoor coverage is probably the most challenging uh, because you need to get much better solutions indoor. Ericsson came out with a product last year called the Ericsson Dot, which totally revolutionized how you can do indoor coverage. Very simple. In minutes, you can get much better coverage here. I think that's one. The other is that the later technology you have, the better it is. 2G, 3G is better than 2G, 4G is better than 3G. Then something more technical, but if you think about uh, the mobile network as a, as a um, highway with different lanes, today you can run on one lane and you're on a, all, all go on the lanes. What we have invented right now, you take away the lanes and you can run on all lanes at the same time. Mm -hmm. So basically you can run on different frequencies, different technologies, unlicensed and licensed spectrum at the same time. Mm -hmm. All these things together uh, can, of course, improve the coverage. Then, of course, sites is always important, uh, and spectrum. I mean, spectrum is yes. sort of the, uh, the oxygen or, uh, of this industry. So those together can improve the quality of the network. We are also in the middle of this mobile data revolution, but according to you know, Ericsson's your own report, you said that out of 7 billion mobile subscribers, an overwhelming 4 billion are still using 2G yes. handsets. Yeah. So, what, so has 3G not taken off as companies like you would have anticipated? And how much has this got to do with high data prices that you feel uh, in some of these markets? I think, it, first of all, 3G has gone much faster than we thought ourselves. I mean, in the beginning, of course, it was slow. Uh, 4G has gone faster than the technology as well. No, it all boils down to one simple thing, is a device. Uh, the majority of the countries in the world, or, uh, they have a non-subsidized model. I mean, if you would be in the North America or in parts of Europe, you wouldn't buy your phone. You would have a package and it's included. In many markets, like here in India, you need to buy the phone. And then the sensitivity on the price on a 3G phone and a 4G phone compared to a 2G phone is very big. I usually say that if you lower the price on an average price on a smartphone with $10, 100 million people more on earth can buy it. So, of course, that's a sensitivity. But the predictions I'm doing right now that we're going to have 7.7 .7 billion mobile broadband subscription by 2020, mm -hmm. that's because I see the networks being built in 180 countries, I see the prices on the handsets coming down, uh, and then people can afford them. So, it will happen a lot in the next five years. I mean, if you think that technology revolution has gone fast, people have phones, everything, the next five years is going to be mind-boggling. Basically, three times as many people on this earth will have access to internet the next five years. And it took us 20 years to get where we are today. So the speed is just going to go like this. Right. And, it's, and now it's beyond 4G because you've started pilots for 5G as well. I think we've also had some tie-ups with some, with some companies. When does it become commercially viable? No, so yes, we were very early out on 5G. Yes, we were on 4G. Uh, uh, the standardization of 5G and conversation is going to be 2020, mm -hmm. uh, but we're going to see some pre-5G uh, networks coming out. We work with many carriers and organizations already right now uh, to, to do a pre-technology, pre but we, we have a good sense of what 5G will be already now. Right. On that note, let's slip into a short break. On the other side is lots more with Mr. Hans Vesper. Stay tuned. <laughs> 